We are in the middle of a series on potential. Potential. Uh, we have talked about, and remember now, the, the kind of the basis for what we're talking about this morning is the, um, uh, the, the definition we're working with through this series on potential is having a capacity for the future. Having a capacity for the future, what God is doing or going to do in our life. We talked about the potential of vision, that is embracing God's vision and we walk in His preferred future. We talked about the potential of love, um, and that is that God's love in us puts life into living, right? <laughs> Amen? And today I want to talk to you about the potential of generosity, the potential of generosity. I'm going to be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 6 through 15. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness." You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that occupies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the unsurpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Father, I thank you this morning for the privilege that I come, that I have to come and to stand in your desk behind your pulpit and preach your word. Lord, I sense this morning that this is one of those messages, a message on generosity, Lord, when it would be easy, Lord, to say I've heard it. And I pray that this morning we would hear it fresh from the Spirit, speaking to every heart, every life, here, online, on YouTube next week, speaking to every heart and every life about the potential of generosity. We thank you, and we praise you for it. Amen. Amen. Most all of you have heard of John D. Rockefeller. The first, he was the first, the world's first billionaire. He was the first person to ever reach the stage of billionaire. By 23, he was a millionaire. By 50, he was a billionaire. Every decision in his life, every attitude, every relationship he had was designed specifically to create his own personal wealth and power. This, is, this comes from some of the autobiography about him. Um, what, and, and most all of you know that, and you, you've seen that. Uh, the, the name John D. Rockefeller is familiar to all of us. What you may not know is at age 23, the wealthiest man in the entire world became so deeply ill at 23. His body was wrapped with pain. He lost all of his hair off of his head. He was in complete, he was in complete agony. I'm, we're told uh, that the richest man in the world got to a place where all he could eat was milk and crackers. That's how low he got. He got he could not sleep. He would not smile. His, one of his associates wrote this. He could not sleep. He would not smile. And nothing in life meant anything to him. Wow, the wealthiest man in the world. Physicians predicted, his personal physicians, which, as you can imagine, were the best that money could buy, predicted that within one year he would die. One night during this year, they say it was an agonizing year-long battle. One night during this year, near the end of that year, um, Rockefeller had a dream, and he couldn't relate all of the dream to everybody, but he did say he left it with this. What he knew the dream was impressing on him was that he could not take any of his success with him when he died. From that then... From that then, he called in his lawyers, his accountants, he called in his business people, and he established what you and I know today as the, as the Rockefeller Foundation. He uh, 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 assigned his assets to, to hospitals and research and mission work. 
They, through his work, and I'll just name two or three, through his work came the, the, um, the, the uh, discovery of penicillin, cures for malaria, cures for tuberculosis, cures for diphtheria, cures, and the list just goes on and on and on. But the greatest thing that may have happened may have been what happened in his personal life. As he began to become generous and to give his wealth away, true story, you can read it for yourself, his body chemistry began to change. He began to heal instead of getting worse. His health had improved, and he lived to be 98 years old. Wow. Rockefeller learned gratitude, and he became whole. Not just healed, but whole. There's a difference in the two. See, here it is. The potential of generosity is that it will transform the world and it'll change your life. I want you just want to look for just a few moments at these scriptures. There are, there are uh, that word generous or generosity or generously occurs 98 times in the Bible. It occurs five times in this passage that we read. It's, uh, the, the word means gift or blessing or benefit or bounty. It also means praise and thanksgiving. It is the idea of abundance given or received. And it applies to every, every, every single area of our life. Most oftentimes we apply this to money, but I want you to broaden your scope this morning. I want you to look because there are actually five, I'm going to go through them quickly, five um, principles of the potential of generosity in our life. And I just want us to look at them as we go through the scriptures. Look, look at verse 6. The first two appear in verses 6 and 7. The first principle is this, is the potential of sowing and reaping. This is the one that people don't know what to think of. This is the one people don't know what to think of. Um, here, is, here is what this principle teaches. How you give sets the pattern for how you receive. That, that's what this, the potential of sowing and reaping is how you give sets the pattern for how you receive. Here's the problem, though. Many people say they believe in this. They hope it is true. They, have, they believe it is true, but they have a hard time letting go of the seed. Imagine with me a, a farmer standing in a seat, uh, and it, you know he's, he's, he reaches down in the bag. He gets a he gets a handful of a handful of seed, and he he knows that the harvest only comes when he when he sows the seed, but he just can't let go of it. He just can't let go of the seed. So it is in our lives. Many times we live tight-fisted and closed-handed, but watch this: the harvest always follows the pattern of the seed. Nobody's ever reaped a harvest that did not sow a seed. It is always true. The, the, the potential of sowing reaping is this. How you give sets the pattern for how you receive. It's true. It's true whether you believe it or whether you don't. It is absolutely true in our lives. The second potential, the second principle, if you will, the second principle is the potential of being a cheerful giver. This is the one few people think of. Whereas the potential for sowing and reaping is the one that people don't know what to think about, the potential for cheerful being a cheerful giver is the one few people think of. And here it is. Here is this principle defined in, in one sentence. Generosity affects your heart more than it does your bank account. And let, let me say that again. Generosity affects your heart more than it does your bank account. And that is a good thing. In other words, um, in fact, we oftentimes in our culture associate generosity with receiving. The Word teaches us that there is more joy in giving than in receiving. Acts 2, 35 says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Geraldine and I, as I was thinking about this, one of the greatest joys of being pastors, Geraldine and I get to actually, um, we get this great benefit of oftentimes we are the conduit through which your generosity gets to somebody else. And can I tell you, um, um, we actually feel like we're cheating a little bit. We get a little more joy in our hearts because we get to fudge a little bit off of your generosity. There is something about, something happens in the heart, something happens in the life. The potential of being a cheerful giver transforms who you are. And the greatest benefit is when Geraldine and I, when we open our hands and when you open your hearts, because here it is. Open your hand and it opens your heart. It's true. Not, it, it, you are mighty, mighty quiet this morning. I'm talking about potential, the potential of generosity. The third potential is this, the potential of abundance. 
This is the one that everybody thinks about. Right? The potential of sowing and reaping is the one that people don't know what to think about. The potential of cheerful giving is the one that few people think about. The potential of abundance is the potential that everybody thinks. This is the one everybody thinks about. Here is the potential of abundance, though, in a sentence. Listen to me. Abundance is on purpose. You find that in verses 8 through 11. Abundance is on purpose. See, watch this. This is something we don't get, especially in our modern uh, Western culture when it comes to generosity. Um, God is able to bless. We should anticipate it. We should expect it. We should expect to live in it. But watch. But the context of God's blessing is in order that you are able to serve and bless others. The purpose of abundance, I'm sorry, the purpose of generosity is abundance. We, we, all, we oftentimes, we get, this, we get this, listen, a world of accumulating, of acquiring, of getting violates the truth here. God blesses in order that you can be generous in your work and in your gifts to others. Look at the scripture again. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all, somebody say all, so that in all times, all things, and at what? All th- the times, having what? All that you need, you will be able to abound in every good work. You know what we like to do? We like to, we like to put parentheses in that sentence sometimes. And we see God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, you have all that you need, Period. Not a period, it's a comma. So that you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he goes on to say, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who is able, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for good will supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. Watch this. And you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Abundance is on purpose. It's something we've lost the context of. In our modern culture today, we think abundance is for us. Abundance is on purpose. It is so that we can, watch this, be generous on every occasion. That's why God, God does bless, but he blesses on purpose. Okay, somebody just to help me, somebody say amen, just so I know you're still, just so I know you're still alive this morning. In fact, it reminds me of a saying I heard many years ago. Generosity, generos- watch this, generosity creates abundance which gives purpose to life. Generosity creates abundance which gives purpose to life. See, you make a living by what you get. You make a life by what you give. The fourth kind of principle here is this. The potential of thanksgiving to God. This is found in in verses 11 um, through 12. This this is the one that everybody ought to think about. You're you're not tracking me. The potential of sowing and reaping is the one that we don't know what to think about. The potential of being a cheerful giver is the one few people think about. The potential of abundance is the one that everybody thinks about. And the potential of thanksgiving to God is the one that everybody ought to think about. Here's, what the, here's this principle in a sentence. God deserves the thanks. God deserves the praise. God deserves the thanks. Our focus, our focus should be on, uh, uh, on thanksgiving to God. When biblically, according to what Paul wrote here, Paul said, when generosity is, is practiced, notice what it says there. Your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. My generosity should bring him thanks, him praise, him glory. People should be saying, thank you, Lord, for meeting my need or seeing me where I am. My generosity should, should be a bring thanksgiving to God. In fact, he says this. It will result in overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. The highest thanks for my generosity is when God is thanked. The highest, the highest place of my generosity is the highest thanks is when God is thanked, when he is praised, when he is thanked. 
The fifth one now, and we're just, I'm just walking you through these. I'm reminded, many of you, I'm just reminding you of things you need, you know, but it gets lost sometimes in our modern culture. The fifth one is the potential of the gospel message, and this is the one that matters most. The potential, the potential of sowing and reaping is the one that people do not know what to think of. The potential of cheerful giver is the one that few people think of. The potential of abundance is the one that everybody thinks of. The potential of thanksgiving is the one that everybody ought to think of. And the potential for the gospel message is the one that matters most. Here it is in a sentence. Generosity points to Christ. Biblically practiced generosity points to Christ. You have to pay attention to get this out of the scripture that that we're reading here. But watch this. Paul associates generosity with an obedience that accompanies the profession of the gospel of Christ. Then he adds this, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, which is the gift of Jesus Christ. Generosity has the potential to spread the gospel message, the grace of Jesus Christ, the story of who he is to people who do not know it. That is the greatest potential that there is of generosity. This week, I'm sorry, last week when we were in Springfield, I was speaking with someone and learned of a project that is being undertaken by some of the Assembly of God Ministries, a project that is being undertaken for fresh wells in Tanzania. And many of you may be aware or you may not be aware that in Tanzania, the, in, the tri, in the villages in Tanzania, the, the um, witch doctor controls what goes on in the village. The witch doctor, he is the governor, he is the policeman, he is the judge and jury. The witch doctor controls what is going on. There's a project going on in, uh, uh, that, that says um, um, in many of these villages, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. In many of those villages, they are without fresh water. They travel miles and miles and miles to get any, in any water whatsoever, and they don't have any uh, fresh water. There are, and there are diseases, there are sicknesses, there, are, there is uh, starvation in me because there is no fresh water. So this project says to the local people, they don't just go in and dig a well. They go to the local people and they say this, if you... If you will build a church and convince the witch doctor to let us put in a well, we'll come in and build a well, put in a well. And in village after village after village, um, the people are pressuring the witch doctor to allow a church to be built and a well to come in. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is making their way into those villages because somebody was generous enough to give that a well can be placed there. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that your potential, when you are sitting here or sitting at your computer or sitting at your phone and you're giving, it has the potential to open doors for the gospel of Jesus Christ in ways that they could not be opened in any other way. The history of the world, and I challenge, I challenge you on this to go and read it, the history of the world is transformation where Christianity has gone into dark places, the generosity has gone in, and then the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ has gone on going in. That's the potential of generosity. It has the potential to share the gospel message. If you want to know, by the way, if you want to know, by the way, how to get in on that project, I'd love to share it with you. Just contact me, and and I will share it with you. Here's the key point of the message this morning, and I know I'm not preaching something that you haven't heard before and seen before, but here's the key point this morning. What is your perspective of generosity? The truth is that our perspective of generosity determines the potential of generosity in our life. If you live just at that first principle, sowing and reaping, reaping, you've got a very low perspective of generosity. If you forget that generosity has the potential to make you a cheerful giver, you are cheating yourself even if you are generous. If you don't understand that the potential, if you don't have the perspective that blessing is, uh, I'm sorry, abundance is about purpose, then you rob yourself of much of the benefit of generosity. If we miss that th- generosity is about thanksgiving to God and the gospel message. See, as you go down that list, as you progress in that list, then the greater your perspective of generosity, the greater for the potential of generosity to transform your life. Amen. I don't want to live 
just thinking because I sow, I reap. I want to understand that it also makes me cheerful in my heart and that God's blessings and abundance have a purpose in my life and that through my being of generous, he receives thanks and he receives praise and doors to the gospel are open, not just in Tanzania, but down the street in my life and in your neighborhood. And see, I just, I want to remind you again, this, this applies to every area of our life, every area of our life. But in order to make this practical, this morning, I want, I want to spend, I don't, I don't, you know me, you've heard me preach for years, you know me, I don't spend a lot of time talking about money in messages, in sermons. But this morning, I want to speak, I want to, I want to give you four key questions that will gauge the generosity in your life, specifically as it relates to money. Why money, Pastor? Well, because money is a universal means or a universal tool for generosity. So I'm going to give you four questions that will help you and I all, no matter what, where you are, will help you and I all to assess um, uh, generosity in our lives as it relates to money. Okay, are you ready? You willing to do this? Say yes, Pastor. Yes. All right, don't be a liar now. Four questions that will help you assess it in your own life. Are you in the habit, am I in the habit of being generous? Am I in the habit of being generous? Do, let me specific, be specific. Do you give purposely, intentionally, regularly? Do you tithe? Do you give offerings on a regular, consistent basis? Do you have a habit of being generous, or do you have a habit of just, well, I'll just wait till the opportunity comes? Are you intentional in being generous? It's so fascinating to me uh, when we start. I mentioned tithe, uh, and, and, and every, all the oxygen leaves the room. It's, it's so fascinating. I, I, I think about tithing. I think about our, so, our misunderstanding about tithing and what's, and what's going on there. Um, I, I can illustrate. Ben, help me a second. Help me a second. I just want you to think about tithing just for a moment this morning. Um, let's say Ben is my father. <laughs> I thought I should just, I thought I should just pause there for a moment. And I'm the kid, right? I say, Dad, I want some French fries. Now, who has the best French fries? McDonald's. Everybody knows that McDonald's has the best French fries, right? Dad, I'm in the back. Say, Dad, Dad, I want some French fries. I want some French fries. And after a little while, Dad says, okay, goes through the drive-thru, buys me the, the, I mean, the big, the big deal, right? The big deal of fries. Gives them to me. Gives me the fries, Right? Then, I'm in the back seat, right? He's, got, he's, he's brought me the Then he reaches over the seat to, to get one of my fries and I. <laughs> and I say, what do I say? I say, leave my fries alone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, and he stops the car and beats my butt and takes my fries. But you see what we do, right? Do it, do it again. He reaches over the seat. Don't touch my fries. You do understand, don't you? When you refuse to tithe, that's what you're doing to God. Don't touch my fries. And dad's thinking, I bought him those fries. <laughs> I gave him those fries. I can take all those fries from him. Or I can cover him up with fries. And he won't give me one fry. Or I say, if I don't say don't touch my fries, another version of that same thing is this. I only have so many fries. I only have so many fries. These fries got to last me. I, I, may have, I may have to snack on these fries for a whole, like, 30 minutes. <laughs> these are all the fries I have. And what they miss is the fact is the dad gave the fries. Dad can keep giving the fries. He's the source of the fries. Thanks, Ben. Can I tell you something this morning? We shortchange ourselves when we don't have the proper view of what's going on with our tithe. God gave it all. 
He can take it all, and he can bless me abundantly. When he asks for a fry, I should say, take all you want. I know you're the source of the fries anyway. Amen? First, do you, yeah, just thank you. First question is, are you in the habit of being generous? Can I just, can I, I'm going to pause here before I go on to the second question again. I want to speak to the, um, to the young people in the building, the younger people in the building. You can, you, can, uh, you can decide for yourself if you're one of those or not. But here's what I want to say. If you're starting out in life, can I tell you what? Start this now if you haven't already. One of the greatest lessons I've ever taught in my life, I was 10 years old when I was taught, I won't go into the whole story, you've, you've heard it before. One of the greatest lessons I was ever taught at 10 years old was to tithe on everything I make. And as far as I know, I've tithed, Geraldine and I have tithed on every single thing we make. I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine getting 40 years down the road and then trying to cut out 10%. So I want to give some advice to the ones that are just starting out, young marriage, young adults, start now. Make it a regular part of your life. And instead of seeing what you're missing, you'll never be able to count what you gain through being generous to God. Amen? Amen. We can just give God praise for that. Yeah. First question, are you in the habit of being generous? The, the, the next three are not going to take as long, but I just want to mention them here this morning. Do you have a posture for being generous? Let me explain to you what I mean by that. What I mean by that is, do you have some set aside in order to be able to be generous? You know, Paul actually teaches us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. The same group of people that we read from this morning, prior, he says, um, on the first day of the week, bring the offering that you've prepared. What is he saying? You need to have a posture for being generous. Let me tell you how that works in Jerry Lynn and I, mine and Jerry Lynn's life. We have years ago, and I, I don't, I can't say that I, that I, this just came to us. This is what we needed to do. Years ago, we set an amount, and it has changed through the years as God has blessed us. Years ago, we set an amount to be in a position to give when the opportunity came. Jerry and I both know what that amount is. In fact, a few weeks ago, I gave a plea about the Benevolence Fund um, and about missions. Uh, and Jerry picked up her phone and bam, bam. So she gave two offerings, both of them to the amount that we already have already set aside. You know, what that does, you know what that does? We, we, it, it, it puts us in a posture. We don't have to think about it. I didn't have to run over and talk or and discuss. It puts us in a posture to give, and we, we, are, we, we stay in that posture. Let me tell you something else it does. There's something else it does. It puts you in a posture. In fact, Paul talks about it in the scripture we just read. It puts you in a posture to not be coerced. I, I, I hate I have to say that, but we live in a world where that happens, right? To not be coerced. Why? Because we have an amount that we give. You're in a posture to bless. You're in a posture to be generous. If you don't have an amount that you in your mind, okay, when there is an opportunity, I'm, I'm going to give this. I'm going to give this. You, you need to set that in your life. It gives you a posture for being generous. Instead of a posture of saying, well, I don't know if I should or I shouldn't, right, it gives you a posture. Now, listen, the third thing goes right in with the second thing. Are you open? Are you open to the Holy Spirit asking you to give? Just as you should be prepared to give, you should also be prepared for the Holy Spirit to ask you to give and sometime to ask you to give more than you're comfortable giving. There was one little amen to that. The greatest blessings of mine and Geraldine's life have been when we've heard God say, be generous. We've heard the Holy Spirit be generous, and when it has moved us out of our comfort zone of generosity, and we've sown it anyway, so it, it has opened the doors to some of the greatest uh, experiences in our life about our relationship with God and trusting Him, and we've seen it transform people's lives and make a difference in the world. Listen, you need to have a habit for being in generosity. You need to have a posture for being generous. You need to be open to the Holy Spirit being generous. That's three questions, and the fourth question sums these all up. What are you going to do about it? This idea of being generous, it's there. It's out there. Well, you can't read the word without being generous. The word generous appears 98 times in the Bible. Jesus talks about money and being generous with money more than he talks about anything else. We, sometimes in our Western culture, we have a hard time assimilating that. You know why Jesus talked about it so much? Not because he had a hard time with it, because we do. So you've got to decide what are you going to do about it. If you're not tithing, when are you going to start? 
If you don't have a posture for giving, when, when, what's going to be your amount? Um, if you're not open to the Holy Spirit speaking to you about giving, how are you going to put yourself in a position to hear the Holy Spirit when those opportunities come? And I'm not just talking about tithing, giving, and offering. This may happen in your workplace. It may happen in your neighborhood. It may, it may happen in, uh, in, many, in your friend's life. You need, to, you need to know what are you going to do about it. So let me just finish with this. Here's what I believe all of this is saying to us this morning, and I'll finish. Live generously with an open hand, and it will open the hand of God, and it'll change your life. Live generously with an open hand, and it'll open the hand of God. It'll change your life. It'll transform your world. I believe that. I believe that everything in my life, in my heart. I'll be 59 years old in June, and I'm telling you, the Lord has blessed me not with abundance, but he's blessed me with being able to understand generosity. And I'm so thankful that I was taught that lesson at a young age. Generosity will change your life because it opens your hand, opens your heart, and opens the hand of God. Short story, and I'll finish this morning. Author Mark Chernoff writes of a family, true story rights of a family. They were going through a tough time. They lived in a lower middle class neighborhood. The, the wife, the mother in the family had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Now they were already going through a tough time. The wife had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, funds were short. Medical bills were piling up. They, they were finding it hard to, to buy groceries. And the 14 year old son Decided he wanted to raise money, find some way to raise money and help. So he went to his daddy. True story. He went to his dad and he said, Dad, here's what I want to do. <laughs> he said, I want, to, I want to take your razor and I want to go around the neighborhood. It sounds crazy, right? I want to go around the neighborhood and I'm going to give people a chance to shave part of my hair for a donation of their choosing. Of their choosing. They can set the amount. I'm not setting the amount of their choosing to help us buy groceries. And then he asked his dad, he said, do you think $100 is too high of a goal to set? And his dad said, son, you know the neighborhood we live in. Don't get your hopes up. True story. Son grabs his dad's razor, goes out the door. Hour and a half later, he comes back with a bald head and $1,225 for groceries for that family. Do you know what changed most that day? What changed most that day was the heart of that 14-year-old boy that saw a way himself to be generous. And when he did, it opened the door for others to be generous. He gave of himself and others gave to him. This story, this story proves the whole point of this text. Generosity with your life and your resources opens the hand of God. So this morning I want to ask you, ask God this week. Ask God to show you how to be intentional in being generous, to give you an opportunity to be generous, and then to help you to actually be generous. Can we do that this week? Can we all agree? Can we all agree, no matter if you tithe or you don't tithe, you've been a giver, you haven't been a giver, what? Can we all agree that this week would be a good week to ask God, God, show me how I can be intentional in being generous. Give me an opportunity to be generous and then help me to actually do it, to actually be generous. Can we do that? I believe that you will. It'll change your heart. It'll change somebody else's life. It may change your world. And it'll open the hand of God. Amen? Amen. Stand up with me. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you this morning, Lord, for being able to preach this message, Lord. And there are many, many here and online that are so generous. I thank you for them. I thank you for their generosity. I thank you for what you're doing in them and through them. And, and the way that, Lord, it not just only benefits the world, but it also benefits the Rock Church and our mission of loving God and sharing life and finding hope. I thank you for that. And I I pray for them, God. I pray that, Lord, that you will continue, Lord, to bless them abundantly, that your hand will be open toward them. 
And then there are some, Lord, I'm sure in this room, and some that are online, maybe some that will watch this on YouTube, Lord, that have had a tough time being generous. They have felt like it's mine or they have felt like if I don't hold on to it, it's not enough and won't last. God, I pray that you would free them from that. What a, what, a, what a bondage that is to live that way. I pray that they will capture, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will capture for them about living generously and it opening your hand and changing their life through it. Free them from that, Lord. Generosity gives a heart of joy, Lord. I thank you for that. And I pray that this week that we would all be in, ask you to show us how to be generous and be in, uh, how to be intentional and in being generous, how to to give us an opportunity to be generous and then to actually be generous. We thank you for it, Lord. And we pray that through these acts, you will be thanked and the message of Jesus Christ will go to a place it couldn't have gone any other way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you move, I just want to challenge you this week. Do this. Do this. If you're living under the bondage of a closed-handed life, there is freedom, my friend, in being generous. Next week, I'll share with you the potential of you. I know it's a strange title, but I promise you the Lord's given me a message that I think you're going to hear, the potential of you. Till I see you again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the blessings of the Lord. God bless you. I love you. Have a great rest of your day.